Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the All Nations Church podcast. Uh, we are still in our season, The Gifts of Christ, uh, and we're having a great time. Uh, I'm joined by my good friend, James Aubrey. Hi, James. Hello, Kia. Hello. You, you might notice, listeners, that uh, me and James aren't actually in the same room this time. Uh, we, are, we are online, and the reason we're online is because we're joined by a great friend of ours uh, who actually doesn't live in this country uh, you might know him from season one. Uh, we're joined by our good friend Anna Skagen. Hi, Anna. Hello. Good to be with. Uh, good to be with you guys. So good to see you, Anna. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Yeah. I'm in Norway, the <laughs> best country in the world. So. <laughs> what, can, what can I say? It certainly has the best chocolate in the world. I know, and the cheese. Yes, that is very. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Although Norwegian cheese, you know, some people, I think it's a love it or hate it experience. The only one that beats the Norwegian cheese is cheeses from Nazareth, you know. Oh. <laughs> See, I have, I have really bad memories of Norwegian cheese because um, uh, various people who visited my family when I was a kid would eat it. Uh, me, yeah, I know. Previous yeah. guests on this podcast, like Erling, would eat very, very smelly brown cheese for breakfast. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> off my school days, but the chocolate love has remained, and my kids have inherited that love of chocolate as well. I think really. the first meat you will get when you come to heaven is the Norwegian brown cheese. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the starter. Well, I can prepare for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, Anna, I wonder if, obviously, you, like I said, you've been on the podcast before, but um, perhaps some of the the listeners tuning in might not know who you are exactly so i wonder before we get into the topic today if you could just give you give us a brief introduction uh, who you are what you do yeah so uh as, yeah my name is honest Cargan. i'm married to kirsty have four daughters eight grandkids one girl and uh, seven boys which wow. is a great thing so uh, based in bergen west coast of norway was working for many years as an engineer uh, but then the last 25 years, I've been full-time in uh, work as an evangelist, traveling the world and helping churches to reach out with the good news and uh, to live a life in the Holy Spirit. So Brilliant. it has been a fantastic journey and it's just just started. Amen. 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 That is great. Thanks, Anna. Now, of course, you've already made reference to it. We're, this season is about the gifts of Christ and you are... You're recognized as a, a an evangelist and Ephesians 4 evangelist, which is the reason we've got you on for this season to kind of ask you a little bit about that, um, what that looks like for you uh, to help effectively help our listeners understand, you know, who these gifts are, what their role is and their function, but also to realize that they are also normal people as well, um, which is something that, uh, but I'm sure James will agree with me on this, is a real blessing anytime we get to spend time around you, Anna, yeah. uh, is not only you bring something of Christ to us, but uh, you're just great to be around. Um, yes. Oh, so yes. Uh, I guess uh, we'll jump in with the first question then. Perhaps for, for listeners who, who would maybe be familiar with the term evangelist, but not in the context we're talking about, could you tell us a little bit, what, like what does it mean to be an evangelist, an Ephesians 4 evangelist? Yeah, so for me, it's um, when you read about in uh, in Ephesians four uh, different gifts. Is that it's gifts that God is given to the church. Yeah. So and then you mentioned the different gifts, you know, and uh, and uh, one of them is the gift of an evangelist. And the primary thing for the uh, um, evangelist is to equip the body of Christ. Yeah. And not for them just to be, you know, moving around on their own and have the big campaigns, which can be okay. But primarily, my I feel as an evangelist, an efficient for evangelist, my the, the main thing for me is to equip the body of Christ, to help the body of Christ to reach out, to find a way how they can share the gospel, how they can uh, move in, in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that's my main focus that will always be my main prayer and that will be my main thing how can i equip the body of christ um so they can uh, um, grow into everything that god has called them to be and to help people to understand that they are jesus will help them to be a physical of man yeah yeah so um that has been helpful for me so i i know what god has called me to do and i try to do as good as I can to fulfill that calling. Because yes. if if the church succeeds, I will succeed. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously what you're describing there is is perhaps people have an idea in their head, you've already referenced it, of the evangelist being the person who does, you know, these huge crusades perhaps, like telling the gospel to a lot of people, which it certainly does involve that. But um, one of the things you're describing there is that you are actually empowering and helping other people to go and do that work, to go and <coughs> tell people about Jesus, to go and reach their friends, to go and reach their family. Could you tell us a little bit about um, what is the difference between somebody who says, I worked as an evangelist, I went and, you know, did evangelism, uh, and somebody who is, is a recognized Ephesians 4 evangelist? Yeah. So I remember when I when I started, when I got saved, I was not a part of a church, me and my wife. We were just uh, not a part of anything. But uh, we started to see people knocking on a flat, you know, and they and, and people came to us and asked questions about Christianity. So we so we just opened our home for people and people started to, to receive Christ. And um yeah. and they got saved, you know, and, and somebody told me, Oh yeah, wow, you're an evangelist and I didn't I never been occupied by titles. I mean the best title must be to be a brother or a sister. Amen. But, yeah. but I realized there was something in me that, you know, because of what I was doing, that I saw more people saved than maybe others. Yeah. Uh, so, but but I but I felt when people told me that I was an evangelist, it, it was like I was going to fill a role or kind of other people's expectation about me. Mm. Mm. Been given a title. But but I think the difference between people who who can who can see some people saved and and, and that is fantastic. Yeah. But I think uh, the difference between you can you can fulfill a role like you can you can preach the gospel you can help people to preach the gospel you can do all the practical things. But the difference between that and and <clears throat> uh, and uh, an efficient for evangelist is. Um, that an Ephesians 4 evangelist, uh, I think he himself would lead people to Christ. Yeah. And he himself would go through all the things that people in the church can feel, like when it comes to uh, the battles we face or the challenge we face or, you know, fair old man or all kind of things. You go through all that. But I think in all the things you do, you can see that God has called you to do something more than just yourself moving in this. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was a, it was a growing hunger in, in my heart. How can I help the body of Christ? Because I saw a lot of healings. I saw a lot of miracles, I, I signs and wonders. I was I was all over the place in Norway when I got saved, and a lot of people was calling me. And that, and on the end, I had to admit that I was really proud. It was all about me. You know, doing the things, and and I, I got a lot of attention. You know, and I was in the news. I was in the newspaper. But but I came to a place where I realized that it's not about me at all. It's it's about Christ. Yeah. And I had to repent, and then God showed me. I saw this the church moving around everyday life. You know, moving around that meeting people, and and I was thinking, what about if I not so much focusing on me, but how can I help the body of Christ to live their life in the Holy Spirit and how they can share the gospel, how they can lead Christ, and how much more effective isn't that? So yeah. then I decided, and I said, God, I, 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 first of all, I had to repent, you know, because uh, I was following the signs and the wonders, and the Bible says that those signs shall follow those who believe. Yeah. So I realized that I had been following the wrong thing. My calling was to follow Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So I repented in that, you know, and then I said, God, help me so I can equip your body. Because I realized that uh, your body is, if I can help them, if I can equip them, um, that would be so much better for me than yeah. just um, preach the gospel, you know. Just for me, one by one, which is so important, but that was not the main thing God called me to do. So, yeah. So, so I think the difference is you can do the things, 
but I think an official for evangelists has a broader way of thinking. They have seen something else. I think they are part of an apostolic uh, work, means you have been exposed uh, uh, to an, an apostle's and a prophet's teaching. Yeah. That you really see Christ in a much bigger way than just Christ my Savior. Mm. Yeah. You see Christ is the Savior of the world. He lives in me, but but he will use his body. Yeah. Uh, so that changed my life in my focus. And, and from uh, the last 25 years, the only thing I know I've been doing is to equip the body of, of, uh, of Christ. Yeah. To not just to evangelize kind of an activity, but to live a life led by the Spirit and live a life where we can see the opportunities every day and to, to reach out and to share Christ with people. Yeah. Brilliant. So I wonder, I mean, there's some things that I think would be good for us to come back to. You particularly referenced working alongside apostles and prophets that perhaps we can come back to a little bit later. But Pat, I wonder if you could tell us then a bit of your story. How did you become aware of your own calling as evangelist? How did that kind of unfold and progress for you? So, um, before I got saved, I mean, I grew up in a, in a Christian home, like a Lutheran home yeah. in Norway. The state church is a Lutheran church. But when I was around 15, 16, it was so boring, you know. So I just, uh, it was no, uh, nothing for me, you know. So I just said, okay, this is not for me. But uh, there was a scripture in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God put a longing after eternity and into every man's heart. There was something, yes. a space in me. I tried to fill it with so many other things, but I was, I was not in peace with myself. But I just was drawn to more occult thing, you know. It was just me. I was, there was nobody else I know who was into that. But I really, I, I, I experienced very early that there is a spiritual world out there. Uh, Satan is real. Yeah. And, and his demon is real, you know. And I and I came to a place where I felt my life was nothing. It was not worth anything. I, I lost hope. I didn't have anything inside of me and really wanted to go on. And then I cried out for God because God, if you are real, if this, if if you are really, if you are, what about when I read about you in the Gospels so or when Jesus was walking around and and he was led by the Spirit? If this stuff is all real, uh, you must show me. Yeah, and <clears throat> and he did. I was twenty five years old and I was uh, came back from Sweden after being studying uh, on the university there, took taking my engineering degree. And I came back to Bergen, I met my wife, and she was a Christian. And then I realized that, uh, Anna, you have given your life to somebody who is just going to destroy your life. What about Christ who came to save your life, mm. to rescue you? Uh, so I just surrendered to him. And I was desperate from day one. I was desperate of everything to do with the Holy Spirit, everything I read about mm. the Holy Spirit, everything they did. I thought, I can do all this. Yeah. And and from day one, I, I, I was led by the Spirit. I could wake up in the middle of the night with names of people, address of people, where people was living. I had a word for them. I could I could meet people on the street. I knew exactly what kind of diseases they had. Wow. And there was a lot of things happening, you know. And, and I saw miracles. I saw people uh, receiving signs from the first time. People was paralyzed, you know, go, wow. co constantly healed, cancer leaving. And I was just <laughs> all over the place, and I was so it was so happy, you know. It was yeah. uh, such a great place to be. The only thing was that after a while, I realized that um, there was something missing in my life because I realized that I was so depending on everything that was God was doing, the signs and the wonders and the manifestations. But I realized what about the person behind the manifestations? Yeah, and and then as I said, I read about that these signs should follow those who believe, and I realized I was following the wrong thing. Yeah, and I had to repent, and I said, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I want to give my life to you, not just to what you are doing. I I, I want to follow you, and I realized my first calling was Christ, right? Not the not the doing part. Yeah. 
and and then I started to see a number saved. You know, me and my wife, we saw a lot of people saved, and and I realized that um, people said I was an evangelist, and I didn't know what that meant. You know, to be honest, but but I realized there was something God had put into my heart that made it possible for me to yeah. lead people to Christ. That there was a gift there, <clears throat> God has given to me. But I, but I didn't understand it before I came into a church in Bergen in 1995, and and I was we came into the church in August 1995, and um, and I sat down there and I was listening to the teaching and we was there for six months, and I felt the one the guy who was teaching most of the teaching, they said he was an, a, a, an apostle has an apostolic ministry. And I didn't know what that meant. But the only thing I was heard was about Jesus is building his church. It's all about Christ. Christ mm. is building his church. Christ is um, will use his body. Mm. And, and for me, it was, it did something with me. Yeah. I realized that Christ in me is bigger than my Savior. He is still the Savior of the world. Yeah. And I realized that the church is its not what something you go to or a member of. The church was the body of Christ. Yeah. yeah. And so little by little, God gave me a, a vision and it was growing in me more and more. And I realized that the church is the body of Christ and God has given the gifts to the church so that he can equip the church so the church can do all the things that Jesus did when he was walking on earth, except yeah. from the cross, mm. which he did once and for all when he died on the cross and he was raised again, you know, and he took all the sins upon himself. But but all the other things he did, um, he wants the church to do. And I yeah. made a decision. I came to a place where I told Jesus, Jesus, the only thing I will is to serve you and I want to serve in your body, the church, and I will help in any way I can, help the church to move in the gift of the Holy Spirit, to move led by your spirit, yeah. and to reach out to preach the gospel, to be the gospel, and to 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 do all the things that you did when you was walking on earth. Fantastic. And that has been the burning fire inside of me, and it still is burning more now than when I yeah. thought. Yeah. And, and Arnie, you've... Um... You mentioned you've been um, in this kind of ministry since 1995, um, working with kind of apostles and prophets. You've spent a lot of time in various countries. The Lord, you spent a lot of time in the UK. So we've enjoyed and experienced your influence a number of times. And I think one of the things that you've become kind of most um, famous for or well known for uh, is your kind of teaching around harvest language. Mm. And um, that's been kind of a really key way that you've equipped us and equipped many people around the world. So could you talk just a little bit about how how you became aware of this this concept of harvest language that you've you've equipped many people in? Yeah, so so I think like uh, as, as the way I'm reading the word, you know, when I read the Bible, you know, we we can be different, you know, we we'll read it in different ways. But I, but I realized very early that the Bible is the manual yeah. of life for us, you know. And yeah. I think, you, I, I remember I was reading through the Gospels, and I was reading about Christ, the way he was walking around, the way he approached people, mm -hmm. his teaching, the way he was moving in, in the power of God. And uh, and and I was more I was more I was reading about that. I I realized that I was not just reading about Jesus and his life, mm -hmm. and I was actually reading about my life. Very good. The life he has called us to live. He said that um, these signs shall follow those who believe, or you will do the same thing as I did. You know, like so. I realized that um, as I was reading, I was just reading about my own life. And also, when I was reading the scripture, I said, how can I live this? What does this mean for me? For instance, when Jesus said many times in the, in the gospel, he said that the harvest is plentiful. Sometimes we can get so used to words if we are in a church, we don't really think, what does it really mean? Yeah. But I was thinking, what does it mean? What, why are you saying that the harvest is plentiful? 
And I realized the reason Jesus saying that was because for the disciples, it, it could be the opposite. That was like uh, uh, for them, the most natural thing to think, oh, it's so close there. Nobody wants to receive this. Or, mm. And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'll open your eyes, guys, and look what's right in front of you. You see people, but I see harvest. Yeah. Mm. So my prayer was, okay, God. And then I read, like I said, if Ecclesiastes 311, God puts, puts eternity into every man's heart. Mm -hmm. And I also read in Colossians that it said, Christ in me is hope of glory. And I yeah. started to think, okay, God, if you put a longing of eternity into every man's heart, and you are saying that Christ in me is hope of glory, not just for me, but for people that I meet. Mm -hmm. I started to think, you know, like and pray, because that I, Jesus, this means for me that if they have a longing after you, and you live in me, and then I meet them, something must happen. Very good. Mm. But even even in even in, in Great Commission, when Jesus is saying that I've been given all the authority and the holy power, and because of that I'm sending you out and you should disciple people. And, and the last sentence was, and remember this, I am with you. And I think that was the key factor. It started with him uh, having all the authority and all the power. And then he tells us what to do, and then he finished. Remember, guys, before you go out there, I am with you yeah. mm. every day, you know, and I realized that, um, I realized that, okay, God, so you are sending us out, you have equipped us, and you live in us, and then we meet people, and I said, Holy Spirit, can you help me, because something must happen when I meet people who have a longing after eternity, Very good. because who they are longing for lives in us as Christians, yeah. and then he said to me, very clear, as a clear voice, honor, I will I will teach you the harvest language. I will help you to recognize ripe harvest. And I said, well, okay, I never heard about the harvest language. Mm. But I realized what he meant, you know, because I, I felt when people can send signals and I was he took me to to the scripture about Zacchaeus. Who heard that Christ was coming into this city, and he was he was living the wrong way. He was a sinner. He was uh, cheating people. He was not a good guy. But but he was running before everybody else, even climbing up in a tree because he was a small guy. He was yeah. desperate to see Christ, and I felt God said, "That's harvest language." He is so desperate, he right. doesn't understand everything, but there is a longing in his heart. Yeah. Uh, cause him to run before everybody else, even climb up in the tree. And then Christ is coming, surrounded by the multitudes, you know. And then he stopped at the tree, and he looks up and he sees Zacchaeus, and he said, Zacchaeus, can you imagine what happened inside of that guy? Yeah. And Christ stopped, uh, surrounded by people, but he saw him, and he even knew his name. And how could Jesus know his name? Mm. Well, because he was led by the Spirit. Yeah. And so when we, and I realized that I could talk to people, and then suddenly they can start to open up and share personal things. And I'm thinking, why are they, why are they sharing this with me? Mm -hmm. And I could hear God saying in the background, harvest language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a guy who was, I was in a meeting and he just came up in my face and I said, I'm an atheist. And I was thinking, why are you telling me this? And why are you doing this This up in my face? And God is saying, harvest language. And I just cried out back to him, you are not. And he just left the building and he came back Sunday morning and got saved and received Christ. Wow. wow. Because he said, I was really called by God, but I was desperate. I was hiding behind the title of being an atheist. Wow. But when you said, you are not. I was so scared of God, I just had to flee. But then God spoke to my heart, and I took my mother, and we went back to the church on a Sunday morning, and both of us received Christ. Wow. Wow. And I think for me, that's harvest language. They will not say, I won't be saved, and you know, they come into the Sunday morning. But maybe they will say different things. Maybe they behave in, in a strange way. But remember, before any birth, there was a lot of chaos and cry and pain and, 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 and sounds. But the result of a birth is fantastic. 
That's very good. So kind of taking a step on from there then, Arna, um, you said earlier on that the evangelist um, has the ability to lead people to Christ, um, goes through all the same things that any other believer will go through in terms of trying and um, to to reach out, facing setbacks, overcoming them, and will have kind of a bigger perspective of, uh, of what Christ is doing because of the grace that you've received from him. So in your experiences over time, what have you found have been the biggest things, either attitudes or actions, that you've had to help believers overcome in order to be more effective in evangelism? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things is that um, we have to understand what it means that the Holy Spirit is upon us. God has, an, God has anointed us. Uh, the evangelist is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He came to convince people about sin and guilt. We cannot do that. Mm -hmm. And if we try, I've tried many times to convince people, the only thing I'm ending up with is a lot of frustration and, 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 um, and uh, yeah, problems. <clears throat> so we need to understand what does it mean that we are anointed with the Holy Spirit and power? Okay. Means that God is bigger than us. God can use our words. Christ, He prayed and He said, "I'm not just praying for them, for the Christians, us, but I'm praying for all those who will believe in Me because of the words that we are sharing." So when you speak the gospel, when you share the gospel, we have to understand that when we do, we give the Holy Spirit something that He can work with. Yeah, mm. He take our words which is the word of Christ, and he will convince people. That's our job, is to bring the word, and then he will he will uh, bring revelation. And another thing is that just the fact that Christ, when he came to the disciples in John 20, 21, he came to them and he said, Peace be with you, the way the Father has sent you, I'm sending. They sent me, I'm sending you. And just the fact that for all Christians to know that we are sent into yeah. this world for a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. We are not here to survive and then and then go to heaven. But God is sending us into this world uh, with with the anointing and with the ability with him himself, God the Holy Spirit taking place living in us to fulfill the great commission that Christ himself started when he came to earth, he got the body, Jesus from Nazareth, and then he was moving around, anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he healed sick. He did all the things God called him to do, and then he's looking at us and saying, my body, continue doing what I did. You can, because the same Spirit who was in me is now in you. Yeah. I think that's the most important things, because so many times, we can turn point. We can pointing on ourselves, and then we come to short. You know, yeah. I can't do this. This is not me. I don't can't know exactly. But what about Christ in you? Yeah. yeah. What about Christ said that I am with you, not I was, but I am mm. is with you. You know. So yeah, it's about identity, isn't it? Yeah. And did you that 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 kind of understanding you have oh. of um, the church being the body of Christ and the church being therefore as the body of Christ, not only a community that cares for one another, but also is doing the works of Christ in the world. Is that something that you got from being exposed to apostolic teaching when you went to Bergen and you first met North Askeland? Is that kind of where that understanding comes from? Yeah, definitely. Okay. I think we started to travel very early. I had some friends in the island out of Bergen and uh, yeah. I know them for, for a long time before we came into the church in Bergen, but they called, I know, I think I called them. I, I really felt God reminded me of them, and I called them, and they said, you must help us. We 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 don't, we want help. We are a little group. We don't know where to go or what to do. So I asked my friend, Noel Faskelanda, who was an apostolic ministry, and we started to, he joined me down there, and then we decided to, to be with them every uh, second week for two years. Okay, and he was doing the foundational teaching all from the Book of Hebrews. Yeah, 
and and um, I was listening to that, and I was think, and then I was listening to the spirit, you know, and we saw a lot of people saved, and uh, and a lot of people healed, and also I was exposed to the teaching of an apostle, and that yeah. did something with me. Christ it was just growing inside of me. Yeah, the, the vision about him and his kingdom, mm. it, it just changed totally changed my way of thinking and working. Yeah, um, and then I was thinking like in the Book of Acts. The first Christians, they they gave themselves to the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, yeah. and the, and the fruit of that was that God, nobody was lacking anything. Everybody mm. got a need need met, you know, and, yeah. and every day God added to the church daily, like those who was receiving Him. Yes. Mm. So uh, so I'm so thankful, and 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 still have this burden in my heart that. Uh, all the Christians that has not been exposed to this uh, divine principles and God's divine plan to to work t together with the uh, Ephesians four ministries that is yeah. there to help us, yeah, uh, and to equip us and yeah. to uh, let us mature and to see really to understand what God has called us to do, you know. And it's fantastic to be part of an apostolic work like that. Yeah, we feel the same way, and that's I think part of the motivation behind this series is that. Um, there are there are a great many things happening in the body of Christ around the world that we celebrate. Mm. At the same time, that which is that which will last forever yeah. is that which is is built upon God's principles, and there's no greater foundation to be building on than Christ is the cornerstone, with apostles and prophets as the foundation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I always, I say it like this: I, I feel God saved me for my own ministry. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant! That's that great. is brilliant. <laughs> Because I, I know there was a lot of attention you know, because of all the things I did when it comes to signs and wonders and miracles. Yeah. But that doesn't say that my character was uh, very good in the beginning. Mm. Well, we can be so fascinated about things, but the only one who really can, uh, we can be fascinated about is Christ and yes. him alone. When we interviewed North for the earlier on in this series, he said that Jesus is the most attractive person in the universe. Exactly. That's, what, that's what's kept him motivated. Mm. Yeah. Like that. And that's the thing, that's the only thing. No, I'm 67. I'm just in the beginning of my ministry. But yeah. my, ministry, my ministry is just to being a part of the body of Christ. Brilliant. We are Brilliant. all brothers. We are not having any yes. titles. So that we are not sitting on a, you know, but but we are serving Christ together. And, and, um, and as I said earlier, the best... The best reports I can have is not what happened when I was there. It's what's happening when I'm not there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the body of Christ is just doing the things, and then find this is actually working. Brilliant. I, I remember when I came into the work very early. I was in a, the New World, the Apostolic in, in Norway. He invited me into his team, a group of people. And I was sitting there, and I was, I was, I felt, I didn't understand what I was talking about because I was not talking about reaching out or uh, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. I was talking about teaching in the body of Christ. There was all kind of things, and I was thinking, "Give me a break! Are, are we in the same planet here?" But then, then I realized that God really spoke to my heart, and I said, "You have to understand." That all the brothers around you want the same thing, but they are different, and you need all the gifts they are representing. Excellent. But you cannot be unfair with your brothers. You cannot read them through your own gifts. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to repent, which I have to do many times. I still have to do, <laughs> believe it or not. And then I said, forgive me. I need you, and you, you need me. Excellent. And that's what it comes to the gift of the Spirit. We need all the gifts. Yes. And everybody wants the same thing, that Christ will have his way, Amen. using his church the way he wants. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Arda, it's been, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on the podcast. It really yeah. has. Um, it's always an encouragement hearing from you, hearing stories of what God's doing through your life. But uh, even just sit, sitting and talking, we come away really understanding in a fresh way uh, what God's got for us as his people um, and feeling empowered. Uh, and it's it's a great blessing. So we just want to say thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. 
And it's a great privilege for me to, you know, to to uh, work together with brothers like you and all the brothers and sisters around the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but just just let Christ uh, have His body, so that He can do what only He can do through us. Amen. 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 Well, thank you very thank much. You, and James, thanks so much as well. It's always good to be with you. Always a pleasure, Kia. Always, always. And dear listeners, we hope you've enjoyed another episode. Tune in again next week for more from uh, this season on the Gifts of Christ. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.